It would be rude to say no. <laughs> and, and, and then they're like, yes, we have different bottles for it. For different authors, you know, Clive Cussler likes his tequila. Is that right, or am I getting it wrong? Yeah. I, I, yep. Okay. So yeah, yeah. And then somebody else likes their rum, and so on. So they they have a bottle of Glenlivet back there, just like from when I come to town. Isn't that bizarre? <laughs> so uh, well, then now I feel really obligated to drink some. I mean, you went to all that trouble. So uh, there you go. Yeah. yeah, exactly, Slancha. So. Uh, thank you guys for coming to this. I, I'm so uh, uh, grateful to you for, for taking the trouble on a Monday night. I know there's got to be some exciting uh, football on where, you know, I don't know what's on. I don't even follow it anymore. Uh, but I was just in New Orleans uh, for, uh, well, the, the story con that they had out there. And so uh, I had, oh my gosh, that's a wolf hunt. <laughs> All right, that's so amazing. Uh, yes, we got to take a photo of that. That's going to be fantastic. Um, that's only the second wolfhound I've seen at a signing. The first one was in Seattle like two years ago, and um, I was, but but they kept it a surprise until the end. Like, I didn't see. So like, there's a line of people, right? And then uh, I'm, I'm signing my stuff, signing my stuff, and then all of a sudden. There's the wolfhound, and I'm sitting down at that point, signing stuff, all right? And, and the wolfhound's face is like, right, right there. Hi, right. Nick. Oh, yeah. That's the way to do it. That's so awesome. So, what, what's the wolf, wolfhound's name? Kara. Kara? Hera. Hera. Oh, how awesome. Oh, welcome, Hera. She's got the purple eyebrows and everything. I love it. Looks just like the Twitter avatar that I use for Oberon. So, that's fantastic. Um, okay, so this is my first mystery that I've ever written, um, and uh, Subterranean Press uh, asked me to do it, and it was the ideal sort of situation where um, I, I didn't have to, you know, if they asked me to write a full novel, I couldn't do it because I'm under contract with Del Rey, right? But if I do a novella or a short story or something, I can pretty much do whatever I want with those. So um, they asked me to write a novella, and I'm like, well, sure, this is probably a fairly harmless way to kind of dip my toesies into the mystery waters and see how it would go. And then it, you know, just like how um, I tried to write the Iron Druid as this sort of grimdark thing and it didn't work out somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of the same thing that happened with the mystery. I'm like, I really can't write noir when Oberon is the narrator. You know? <laughs> the, there's no way it's going to happen. So, um, yeah, I think it's just kind of, you, you always have to kind of be true to your characters and uh, let them tell the story. So it wound up being this this pretty fun little thing and I was, you know I, I'm pretty sure you guys will laugh if I'm giggling while I'm writing it. So yeah, that was that there was a lot of that going on as I was writing and um, Hopefully you guys uh, will dig it too. So uh, and then Luke Daniels, of course, has been fantastic How many of you guys listen to the audio? Quite, quite a few of you, yeah, so yeah, it looks like a third awesome. of you or so. So yeah, uh, that actually is about right. Like, a third of my readers are actually audio listeners. And uh, it's because Luke is fantastic. So he was able to uh, do this with me. Um, so, because uh, I've, I've been feeling guilty. When he does a novel for me, what happens is the way, that, the way it works publishing-wise is that they pay him per hour of finished audio. Like, what's your rate? Two dollars a finished hour, whatever it is, right? Yeah. It's more than that. <laughs> he's worth a lot more than that. He actually charges more than most because he's that good, right? He deserves more. But still, um, it's not really enough. So on, on this novella and on the short stories, the two tales of the Iron Druid Chronicles, um, what I've done is a, a ACX lets you do a royalty split with the audio narrator on those. And so that's what we've done with this so that Luke can get more money for his talents than he can on my novels. I can't change the way Random House or anybody, any other publisher does their contracts, but when I self-publish with him, then we just split it 50-50. And uh, yes. that way, you know, he, he can buy an extra taco. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or a bottle of Glen Livid hanging around in his house until I come over. <laughs> that would be fine too. I don't know. He lives in Michigan. So I only just met him last time uh, in January on the States tour, oh. and um, and I got to see him do um, the Oberon's voice for the first time and see what his face did. That's what I was really curious about. <laughs> does your face change when you do that voice, right? And it does a little bit, um, 
he, his eyes kind of close when he talks about sausage, you know, that little <laughs> ecstasy going <laughs> on there. Um, and, and then um, he just did, in case you guys missed it, he has a Facebook page now, and you can go to his Facebook page and see two different live readings that he did, and followed by a Q&A of the Purloined Poodle's first chapter. Oh. So if you would like to see him in his little home studio, he actually does this in his home studio. He like bought this, you know, rig, and his uh, basement is kind of all, you know, full of fun soundproofing and sound dampening. I don't even know what the technical terms are. <laughs> but he, he's got this funky, cool studio in his basement, and he just works down there. Uh, during the day, and then everything gets shipped off, you know, uh, and then he reads everything off his iPad. This might be a little bit too much for all of you guys who just read the print, so sorry about that. I ramble. It happens. Um, so, so anyway, writing things from, from Oberon's point of view um, is always fun. This was the first time I had to plot it, however, because when I write my novels, and Atticus or Granuel or Owen is the narrator, I never really plan Oberon, I just, he's just me being a smartass as <laughs> things go along. So this is the first time I really had to plot things and realize, well, he can't do everything, he has to have Atticus do it, but, you know, he, in his mind, he will be the boss, and he's, you know, always <laughs> the one in charge. So um, that was kind of my approach to the whole thing. And then uh, we got Galen Dara, who does my self-published work. She does the art for my self-published stuff. So Subterranean agreed to hire her for the Purloined Poodle as well. And she lives down in Tucson, and she does this just beautiful, gorgeous stuff. So all of you who bought a copy of the print book tonight, you're going to get a, a, a copy of the poster, but without the type all over it. And then I signed it, and then if you ever run into Galen, you can have her sign it too. Um, and then what I want to do is give this to everybody who's here who has you know, bought a copy. If you bought two copies, I see you have two copies, sir. Thank you. you have two, you're awesome. So, if you have two copies, then yes, you get two posters. All right? And then once everybody who's bought a book has a poster, I want to make sure they get them first. After that, if I have some left over, y'all could take some more. Because I think I'll have a few left over. So, it's all good. Um, so, then I just want to tell you a couple of, of things that I've got coming up. But after that, I would take questions from you guys. I don't have like a, a gigantic program or anything like that. Um, right now, what I'm working on is a collection of short stories. They're all new that will come out next July. I have to get this finished by the end of this month. Well, <laughs> October 31st is due. So um, there's going to be Atticus in um, 1850 San Francisco Ooh. during the gold rush. That was fun. <laughs> um, and then there's uh, going to be a story uh, from Perun's point of view. That was a blast to write. <laughs> um, uh, two different stories from Owen's point of view. Um, and he has, that's okay, I like him too. Um, just one second, real quick. Here's the thing about Owen. <laughs> He's partially based on my dad, alright? <laughs> my dad was a bit ornery and just didn't want to hear any of their shite. And so anyway, uh, he, he was very, but at, at, the, at the center of this very sort of um, pseudo-macho exterior was a gooey center. You know what I mean? He's got, he, he has a you know, very tender heart inside, but he doesn't want to show it uh, necessarily to everybody because, you know, he doesn't want to be teased or whatever, you know. So anyway, that's kind of what Owen is in, in my own head, and um, he happens to be my editor's favorite um, character now. Um, and when I get my notes back, like for State, when, I, when I, I send in State and I get my notes back from my editor, she had no notes on the Owen chapters. <laughs> <laughs> These are perfect. Move on. <laughs> So, I mean, for whatever reason, I can nail his voice perfectly. She had things for me to fix for Atticus and Granuel, but Owen's like, nah, this is great. So, um, it's, it's really a lot of fun for me to write um, his stuff. And uh, there are two different stories. One is when, um, it's called The Boogeyman of Bura Bog. <laughs> you know how Owen says he, he hates guys in bogs? You're going to learn why. <laughs> and um, he, he has, uh, I, I wrote that on his typewriter. Uh, an old manual typewriter from 1956 I found on eBay. 
Uh, there's a guy that lives 10 minutes away from me who is one of the few remaining living typewriter repairmen. And he kind of looks like it. You can sort of tell, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and so, uh, you are too? That's awesome, dude. All right, but, but I mean, are you still practicing it? No. Okay, all right, this guy's still, he's not retired yet. So he's still doing it out in Boulder. So I asked him, like, you've, you've seen your fair share of typewriters and you know what breaks down and so on and so forth. So what should I buy? And he told me I should get either a Hermes or an Olympia, either German or Swiss manufacturing, post-World War II, like 50s, 60s, 70s. Those are really well engineered and manufactured and they, they you know, are easy to repair. Everything is, is good with those. Does that sound? Yes, it it, yes there you go. So I went to eBay, they're out there, man. <laughs> Look for the ones that have photographic proof that they work, that there's typing there, you know, that you can type on them. I got it and I almost had to do almost nothing with it. It was in really good condition. So I just had this guy do a tune up on it and it's, it's glorious. So here's what I did. I typed the whole story, the Boogeyman of Burra blog, out on a manual typewriter. I asked my editor for permission first and I sent, I sent it to her already. And then she is going to edit it the old-fashioned way with a red pencil. And we're going to go back and forth until we get what's called the accepted version. Okay? So then we're going to take all of those drafts. The, my, my first draft, my second draft. I, God, i got to type this thing out again. Right? Uh, however many drafts it takes until it gets accepted. We're going to put that up for auction. Uh, it's a one-of-a-kind thing, right? Where you get to see my writing process and how bad my, my first page, oh my God. <laughs> I had a, like this, this inept metaphor where I actually typed out, oh dear God, no, let me start over. Because I didn't know what to do, right? Be because because like, like when, the, when you have a, a, a computer, you can just highlight, delete, and it's gone. And now we actually, in a way, we've kind of lost something, right? Because now you don't really see the writing process. It's, it's gone even from the author when they just highlight and delete. That's gone forever. And you don't see the stages that they go through as they're trying to compose. So <laughs> you're going to see every ugly stage of my composing <laughs> um, on, on this particular story if you wind up getting it. What we're doing is we're donating it to uh, Patrick Robbins' World Builders Charity, which benefits Heifer International, which gives... Um, sustainable agriculture, like goats, chickens, things like that, to folks who are hungry uh, around the world and, and trains them in how to build a sustainable economy. And so it's a super cool um, cause and they, they do a lot of good in the world. And I just thought, well, you know, it, what World Builders does is it, it basically funnels everything to heifer, but through a literary means. So I always send them signed books, but I thought, well, this will be a really cool thing to send. It's kind of a one of a kind item. So um, that's in the process of getting done. So they'll do an eBay auction for it. So if you guys win it, woohoo! You know, thank you for um, you know helping folks out, and you will have uh, a really interesting kind of item there. I can't wait to see Trisha's notes on this when it comes back to me. <laughs> so that's one of the Owen stories. The other one I'm actually working on right now, um, and that's called Haunted Devils, and it's uh, being set in Tasmania. So you can kind of, you know, guess at what's going to happen there. Um, and then uh, there will be a Granuel story in there and all of that. So there's, there's going to be several Atticus stories and then, you know, some of these other narrators will show up as well. And the whole thing will be called Besieged and it will be out next July. So, uh, yeehaw, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, I won't be back here for that. I'm sorry. Um, I will probably be in the Northeast. I keep coming here all the time because, of course, I need to, right? There's good stuff here. Yes. But yes. I've, there's so many places in the Northeast that I've just never visited, and I feel bad for those folks who have been reading all this time and have never seen me. So I'm going to be doing a little driving tour just for the short story oh, cool. thing. I'm going to do all cities that I've never been to before. And, and then if they don't come and see me, then I'll say, well, you had your chance. Yeah. <laughs> i got to go back to Phoenix now. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, that, that'll be just for the, the besieged one. And then the other thing that I'm really excited about next year is A Plague of Giants. That is my first epic fantasy. And that will be out next September, about a year from now. So I will come back here for that. So uh, I hope you guys will feel like giving it a try because it's not Druidic at all. Uh, there's no Irish wolfhounds in it, but there are other fun things. Um, so I, I, I'm super excited because uh, a lot of the things that I've done with the Iron Druid stuff where I have different points of view, uh, in different voices, I really kind of 
that was all training for the Plague of Giants, because that has 11 first-person points of view in an epic fantasy, which to my knowledge has never been done before. I don't know. Uh, maybe it has been, but I just haven't heard of it, but I've never seen one like it before. I see a lot of third-person multiple points of view in epic fantasy, but not first. So it was a, kind of tricky to figure out how to get it done, um, but I loved it because that was challenging me, you know? I can write the Iron Druid books pretty fast now. I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit better at it now that I've had practice. So I'm always looking for a challenge, and this took longer. Uh, this was a, a year and a half. In fact, I was, I, was, I was taking so long, that's when they said, Kevin, can you just take a break from the epic for a little while and write, you know, book eight? So, yeah. <laughs> so I wrote Staked in four and a half months. That was the fastest I've ever gone. So, um, so after I finish this, uh, so that's like what's coming out next year in terms of you're going to get Besieged and then you're going to get a Plague of Giants. But after I finish up with Besieged at the end of this month, that's when I start book nine of Iron Druid. And that's due at the end of May. So which means you probably won't see it until 2018. I'm sorry, but that's the, that's the way publishing works. It's just a very, like you got about a year to wait in between the time that I finish it and by the time you're able to buy it. Because a lot of stuff has to happen in between. Lots of editing and lots of like meetings with the sales force. Which is really bizarre. <laughs> I don't know what those meetings are like, but uh, someday maybe I'll find out. So that's, that's basically what I want to tell you guys. I just wanted to let you know what I was up to, and I wanted to thank you for being here, and then if you have questions for me about anything at all, I'd be delighted to answer them. Do you have questions for me? Yes. So is it official that Book 9 is going to be the last Iron Druid book? Is it official that Book 9 will be the last Iron Druid book? Yes. Oh. Well, here's I have, I have I have various reasons for them. Do you want to hear why? Or? Yes. <laughs> okay. In Irish mythology, nine was a really really big deal. If I I I have always thought, and this has been my plan for a long time to do nine books. I have always thought that if my narrator comes from a culture where nine is a big deal, he would naturally tell his own story in nine installments. But then I cheated by doing other short stories in the books, right? <laughs> so that's my way of getting around the nine thing. I'm giving you extra stuff but it is always supposed to be nine books. Um, but also, partially as a reader, for whatever, this is, I admit, an irrational prejudice. I will not read a series that goes over nine books. <laughs> I, once it gets to double digits, I'm like, that's too much of a commitment, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because there's so much to read. Yeah. Look around, right? Yeah. Yeah. If, if I'm gonna commit that, I mean, you really have to hook me hard to get me to commit to something. So I look at the Wheel of Time, and I've never, I've never opened it. You know, I'm just, I'm not gonna, You're because it, out. yeah, I, I'm not gonna, because just because it's too long. You know, I don't have that much time to read and to devote to a series like that. So since I, and I think that other people may share that same sort of feeling. Everybody's busy, so I know that there are epic fantasy readers who are totally into gigantic series that go forever, and that's awesome. But a lot of folks probably aren't. And so um, I want to kind of respect that, the reader that's like me, I guess, in a way, and keep it at nine so it seems manageable to somebody who's new to the series when they get there, if that makes sense. This might be very, you know, I, I've thought about it a lot more than you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, th there's all of that. And then also I've uh, experienced, maybe you've experienced, you've been reading a series and you can tell towards the end, like, I think the author maybe lost interest. <laughs> and I don't want to be that guy. I want it to be fresh, and I want it for, for me as well as you. I know that you probably won't have fun unless I'm having fun. So I want to make sure that I end when I'm still having fun, and I am. So um, that, that's, that's part of it, too. It, yeah, I, I kind of believe in the philosophy of always leaving wanting more, even myself, because then maybe I'll come back. <laughs> but, but sometimes you just need breaks. And that's why I decided, you know, I need a break. I need to do an epic. I need to do Star Wars or something like that. Because there, there was a while there I did six books in a row. I'm doing nothing but Iron Druid plus short stories and all that stuff. You know, I'm like, I've been with these characters way too long. I need to try something else, just get a change of pace. So anyway, that's, that's why it's, it will end at nine. But that does not mean I can't do something else with other characters or pick up the story later down the road. So, yes. Um, I was wondering at what point when you were first thinking about the Druid Chronicles and Atticus that you decided to introduce Oberon, that that was going to be a primary Well, it started character. with Oberon. Yeah. I like Before doggies. Before Atticus? Yeah. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> it started with Oberon, because um, I like doggies. 
And um, I wanted to come up with a magic user who could conceivably work well with animals. I didn't like the idea of a wizard or, or witch because if you look at the mythology surrounding them, there's often sort of a servant master kind of relationship that I, I find rather uncomfortable. Like they're a familiar or whatever, they have to do their bidding and that kind of stuff. And I didn't want that, I want this to be a friendship. And so that's why I went with a druid, where I thought that they would be much more, you know, cool with being a friend with an animal, right? And then I started to get into the mythology and stuff, and it was so fascinating. I just, you know, and everything kind of built with there, from there. And then um, I had to figure out why would there be um, a druid that was this honking old, right? <laughs> Still around in the world yeah. and so on. And then I found that there's like three different ways built into Irish mythology where they could do that. They had the... Mononon McLear's hogs, you slay them and eat them and they just kind of regenerate and come back. They're, and it was like the bacon of youth. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was awesome. And then uh, Govnu had uh, ales that he brewed that, that uh, rejuvenated or, you know, and all that. And then there was even the, the, the I think it was Dian Kecht, who had these healing pools that would heal warriors. Not necessarily turn their life, you know, clock backward, yeah. but it would heal them very quickly. So uh, there was that, and then there was the thing that I went with, was, which was the implied ability of Ermit to know all of this herb lore yeah. to be able to do all this kind of stuff. So that's what I, so since that was already there, I'm like, man, I can't leave this alone, right? <laughs> and uh, it, everything kind of built up from there. Uh, and I was also interested in the idea of a very long-lived individual because my father's health was failing. So I was very much preoccupied with the idea of what would it be like if we had more time to be with the ones that we loved, and then what would happen when uh, abruptly, you know, you really can't be with them, yeah. and how do you deal with all that? So that's where that, uh, he passed away right after I finished writing Hexed. Oh. Mm. So he got to hear it. My mom yeah. read it to him. Oh. And uh, then he passed away, and then so after he passed away, that's when I'm writing Hammered. And so then you have the scene with Mrs. McDonough, where Atticus sits on the porch and says goodbye to her because I was very much feeling you should always say that you love somebody while you have the chance. And, and, and tell them goodbye just in case. That if, you, if you know something's going to happen or whatever, there's, there's a potential, you know. So that's what I was thinking of at the time because um, I knew my, my father's health was failing and I meant to go see him, but I just missed him. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, was, he was out, of, you know, I was not in the same city as he was at the time, so he passed away and I, I didn't get get up to see him before he left. So that was that was very much on my mind while I was writing that. Um, yes? So I want to thank you because I was a hardcore science fiction, really not a fantasy fan at all, oh. until urban fantasies. You're welcome. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I didn't even know urban fantasies were a thing, but you and Jim Butcher really got me hooked on those. When you developed this character, now you're writing epic fantasy, mm -hmm. why did you go that route? Uh, of urban? urban fantasy. Oh, I love the mashup part of it. I yeah. love the mashup qualities of urban fantasy, where let's let's take our, our current world. I'm not really building a world in the sense because it's already here, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in all of this stuff from a whole bunch of different sources and then just see what happens. And that's why I think urban fantasy has such vast potential as a genre. I don't think we've seen everything that we could possibly see. I think that there have been some ruts <laughs> that people have kind of fallen into. Like, let's all do, there was a lot of vampire and werewolf stuff, right? Yeah. And so, because that was such a norm, I had a vampire in my books, yeah. right? I had to have a vampire so it would be called urban fantasy. <laughs> but he's not the main character, right? And then there's the werewolves, and I was noticing a lot of werewolf books were like, they're always having blue collar jobs. And I was like, what's up with that? Like they can't, <laughs> werewolves are stupid or something? Or, or, or they can't only, they can only manufacture things or work on cars? I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like why can't they get a college education and, and you know, be Have bankers? Or, you know, so yeah, that's why I made them lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to flip that stuff on their head, you yeah. know? You know, can, uh, you know, obviously all, all professions are noble, but I was just saying, if, if I'm seeing the same thing over and over again, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to replicate that. So, um... I kept, you know, here's some werewolves and here's a vampire, but the rest of this is just going to be new stuff that I'm going to mash up together to entertain myself. And that's what I was doing, and I honestly didn't think anybody would like it. Because I was like, this dog, he's so crazy. You know? Nobody's gonna, this, 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 is too, this is too silly. Nobody's going to buy this. You know, and so that, and that's what I thought. And when I got done with it, I'm like, well, I'm done with that. 
And then my wife, Kimberly, she's like, well, okay, so get on it, sell it. Well, no, I, I mean, who would want this? And she said, no, it's better than anything I've really seen, so you will, you will do this, or there will be trouble. Okay. So, um, so, so I sent it out, you know, and I got an agent, and then the agent sold it in two weeks, so. Thank you. Yay, wife! Yeah, she's always right. <laughs> yeah, she was right. So I, and, and, but it's because of that, what I learned from that though is that I should just be writing not for any sort of market or anything like that. I should be writing to entertain myself because coincidentally it winds up entertaining a lot of other folks too. Because what I, I, for Hounded, I mean you look at it, what am I doing? I'm just putting in a bunch of stuff that I love. I, it's all my little geeky references and my English teacher jokes, you know, which I, you know, sometimes I fear nobody's going to get but other English teachers, but I put them in there anyway. And um, I actually had one come up to me in New Orleans like, I got all those things about modernist poetry. I'm like, yeah, you know what I'm doing there. You saw it. So, so those things uh, I, I'm having a great time with, and then, you know, like in Hex, I'm being very snarky about taking attendance and stuff like that, too. Uh, a lot of the things about, uh, about education that, that bothered me was all the things that w had actually nothing at all to do with actually educating the kids. So I do miss the kids, but I do not miss faculty meetings, because I've never been in one in my life that was worth my time. And I don't miss administration or any of that stuff, you know? But... Yeah, the kids, I miss that, and I miss uh, talking with them uh, and getting them excited about reading and talking about books. So, yes, sir? Could you give us one most favorite and one least favorite thing about the job or the industry? About, about writing? Yeah. Well, well, the favorite part is there's no boss, no pants. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a dream, right? I think the dream for everybody is I want a job where I don't have to wear pants because basically pants is a tool of the oppressor. Pants, <laughs> pa pants equals the man, right? You don't want to work for the man. I mean, you don't want to wear pants. You know, if you can make money, in, you know, and in, in be in your underwear or whatever, then yay, right? That's what you got to do. So that part I love about it. I really, I do love uh, not having to answer to anyone, even though being a teacher was pretty independent. You know, you, you didn't have your boss in your room every single day or anything like that. Um, that's probably why I was attracted to teaching in the first place, because I could be pretty independent in what I was doing. Um, so I do love that part about it. Uh, probably least favorite part about it is having to promote <laughs> my, my, my stuff. Um, I'm not much of a salesman. I, I don't really dig that. In fact, I, I used to be a graphic design major, and I got out of graphic design. I was into it for the RT part. Oh, for sake. And then I quickly realized the graphic design is actually not that at all. It's art for commercial sake. And, and so it, I was being trained on how to manipulate people to make them buy something they didn't need or even didn't want, but I'm going to make them want it anyway, somehow. And um, since that was something I didn't really enjoy, and I got out of it very purposefully, the fact that I now have to try to do things to make people buy my book is probably my least favorite part of the job now, you know? Um, so I'm very glad that after tonight, I don't have to tweet by the purloined poodle anymore. <laughs> um, if there's copies left over, I might say, hey, the poison pen's got some, or if, uh, but otherwise I'm gonna be kind of going, going dark on the promo for, uh, for quite a while now. Uh, Cause I don't have anything to promote till next summer. So I'm just gonna enjoy and be silly, you know? More, more uh, conversations between Oberon and Owen because I can just kind of goof around, you know? So, uh, yes ma'am. Uh, are you going to do any more stories or sections of stories on uh, Owen's New Grove? Well, <laughs> any more, the question was, any more stuff about Owen's New Grove, like his apprentices? And yes, the Haunted Devils involves his apprentices um, in Tasmania. So um, that that's uh, definitely something where you're going to see, and, and if there's a direction for the, you know, series in the future, that would be it. Because I would be focusing on the New Druids. That would actually probably be the new series title, The New Druids. So, I just don't know if I'm going there yet. It's way too far. I have to finish the epic fantasy first before I can even think about really trying to sell a different series. So, uh, yes, sir. Excellent necklace, by the way. Thank you. Uh, are there any books that you use specifically for the uh, Irish mythology? No book. Well, okay, one book. Um, James McKillips? It might be McKilliop. James McKilliop's uh, Dictionary of Celtic um, Mythology. There are several dictionaries of Celtic mythology out there. James McKilliop is probably the best one. Okay, so I used him just for 
very basic, here's the name of a god or goddess, and what are they god or goddess of, and maybe there's some references in there to their major stories. Where can you find a myth that involves this particular character? So it was a really cool, uh, basic, sort of primary source to find out where to look for more details, if, you know, if that makes sense. Better in that sense than Wikipedia was. But Wikipedia <laughs> does have, uh, I, I got a lot of stuff from there in the sense that if I look up two of the Danon, eventually in the bibliography under these folks are links to Trinity College in Dublin. Trinity College in Dublin has all of the old Irish myths uh, free, available online, with the old Irish on one side of the screen and an English translation on the other. And that's what it did. So it's not published in book form that I know of. It might be. But I just read the stuff online. And, and so you've got the Annals of the Four Masters. The, you want to look at the Fenian cycle, the mythological cycle. Those are the two real big ones where you get a lot of this action with the Morrigan and, you know, Cuhulin and, you know, all of the big, you know, Finn McCool. All, all of those guys. Uh, and that's where also where you see Angus Oak be a dick. <laughs> That's, that was just fascinating to me about about the Irish, that their god of love was such a huge dick to everybody and was almost never really loving. And um, and then I also found it fascinating that uh, I love Flittish. Flittish fascinates me as a goddess because she is a hundred, I mean, on the face of it, she's just a copy of Artemis and Diana. But one very important difference. Artemis and Diana are virgin goddesses, and Flittish really isn't. <laughs> she goes the other direction and celebrates it, which it, uh, celebrates sex, which is uh, something that I, that I loved and wanted to also bring to the fore, because this is what Ireland and the Celtic society was like before <coughs> St. Patrick and the patriarchy came in. That women could do whatever the hell they wanted, they took whatever partners they wanted, and it was all good. And everybody was fine with that, and then things changed quite a bit. So this was, uh, the, I really like Flittish because of how you, you sometimes don't know whose side she's on, and that's because she is her, her own person, and she's going to make her own decisions, and um, it could go either way. So I really like her because of that, and Brian and the Morgan too, right? They're, they're awesome. So, yes? Nope. <laughs> there are other characters. I mean, well, I will, I will share with you my one of my editor's notes about the epic. She's like, I, the bestiary that you have created for this world is incredibly rich and fascinating, and I love it. So there are a lot of critters in in, in the book, but not wolfhounds, not dogs, not talking ones. <laughs> All right. So, but but there's a lot of cool stuff in there, and I had a blast with it. And there's a lot of focus on the natural world because obviously this is something that I'm very concerned with. So, yeah, that does play a part. Any other questions? Oh yes. Is Oberon looking for any more meaty mysteries? Oh, okay. So yeah, I would love to write another one. It's just me finding the time at this point. Um, I have to meet my deadlines for Del Rey. Those take priority. Um, if I can squeeze in another mystery. Subterrain has told me we'll do it. So they're basically whenever I can get it done, they'll they'll do it. Um, but I, I don't I can't commit to a deadline or, or a date with them because I really have to be committed to the the larger books first. You know I have to finish up the Iron Druid stuff and then I also have to finish up the Epic Fantasy. But I would love to do more Oberon stuff just because it's fun. So uh, and then I, I did by the way all that stuff in Portland. You can go and see. I, I went, uh, while I was on tour for state, I had uh, a person there uh, guide me around the city, and I, I went to all those places, and I picked out the house where uh, things happen, and, uh, and we meet Starbuck. Uh, I know exactly where that place is, and I describe it and all that stuff, so uh, it was a lot of fun to, to do that. Uh, Aaron? Uh, I know you traveled to Toronto and Japan for some years, so you did. anywhere from the last book? I don't know yet. I can't, I can't tell you that. <laughs> that, that might spoil something. 
Um, in, in Hunted, I, I wanted to get, you know, like, I didn't travel for Hunted, but I, I knew a guy who was in Germany and could really tell me about the, the path that they would take um, throughout Germany on their run. So whenever I don't get there myself, I try to find somebody who's native to the area to help me out. Uh, that's also how I located Hearn's Oak and where it should be. Um, there is a lady who uh, came out here to see me for the release of Trick. She flew out from England. And, and she's like, well, you need some help with it. I'm like, yeah. I need my, I have to know. Where is Hearn's Oak? She goes, well, it's, I think it's on, I know someone in the Royal Society who works for the Castle of Windsor. And so she, she contacted this guy. He was basically a groundskeeper for the Queen. And uh, he's like, yeah, Hearn's Oak or where the spot it was, and there's a new one there. The, you know, the old oak had lived past its life expectancy and was torn out and so on, but there's a new one there. And so that exists, but it's on royal property and not available to the general public, but, and they've got it even like a little fenced off and stuff. So they kind of told me where it was, and I was able to kind of look down on it from Google, Earth, you know what I mean? You know? But, but, and then just get the lay of the land so I could tell what, you know, how the battle and stuff would kind of play out and make everything real as possible. But that's um, what I do when I can't get there myself. But yes, for Staked, I was in, I was in Berlin, I was in Prague, and of those hotels that they mentioned, I was staying in those hotels. <laughs> so the Grand Bohemian in Prague, you know, the, and, and all that stuff that I, I was describing that because that's the hotel I was in, and I, I knew I could follow easily all of the streets and all that stuff for, for the chases and so on and so forth. So. Um, yeah, I try to map all that stuff out. In fact, for the in Hexed, when they have the the chase scene with the witches through, you know, the Mitchell Park neighborhood in Tempe, I walked that whole thing. I mean, I, I do everything as authentically as I possibly can when, you know, if, if I can. Uh, somebody else? Yes, sir. Not yourself, but who's your favorite uh, urban fantasy uh, author? Oh, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, well, tell me a few of them. <laughs> okay, um, I I really like Sherry Priest. Um, she, although sometimes she goes into horror and steampunk more than urban fantasy, but she does have a really funny urban fantasy duology about a vampire that you know. There, she kind of focuses on the obsessive compulsive behavior. Like if you want to mess up a vampire coming over, just dump a bag of rice. <laughs> and then I have to count them all. <laughs> uh, you know, like that that slows them down. Damn it! Uh, and, and then. Um, she, she writes, a, she just came out with one called The Family Plot that's a horror story set in Chattanooga, and, and I love it. Kind of creeped me out. Um, yeah. And then uh, I love Jay Wells uh, quite a bit. She has two different urban fantasy series. Uh, one is a vampire-based kind of thing, uh, and then another one is um, Dirty Magic, the, the Kate Prospero series, probably one of my favorite heroines. Um, so, uh, Jay Wells, she spells her first name J-A-Y-E. She lives in Dallas. Charlene's fun, of course. Um, she she was there at, at, in New Orleans, and I got to say hi to her. Um, and Jay was supposed to be there, dang it, and she wasn't. Um, and then Rachel Kane, of course, is fantastic. Um, and I love Delilah Dawson's stuff. I don't know if you guys are into Weird West at all, or if you're even aware of the genre. Yeah. But, um, okay, so Weird West is the idea that it's urban fantasy, but in the old West. So... Now we have vampires and other little critters in the Old West, so we're dealing with some of the steampunk issues, but without the steampunk, it's more uh, more of the, God, there's a lot of dirt and revolvers around here. <laughs> <laughs> so, and horses and stuff. So, um, <coughs> Delilah Dawson, uh, writing as Lila Bowen, wrote this book called Wake of Vultures that I thought was absolutely brilliant, like the best book I read and, uh, of, of last year. And uh, it wasn't just me who blurbed it, it was you know, Chuck Wendig and Patrick Rothfuss, and I mean, just the list is huge of all the people who have amazing things to say about this book. And the sequel to it, Conspiracy of Ravens, comes out this week on Tuesday. Well, that's tomorrow. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> okay, so I'm buying that tomorrow. So Conspiracy of Ravens is out tomorrow, and um, I'm, I can't wait to read it. So check out that if you'd like uh, any kind of Wild West stuff. This, well, basically the heroine 
Her name is Nettie Lonesome. I already like this, right? Oh, okay. So it's, it's what she, the way she describes it is like, think of Lonesome Dove crossed with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> That's what it's like, okay? Yeah. So, so she accidentally kills a vampire, accidentally because the dude is attacking her, and she just takes this piece of wood and just kind of just stabs him with it, and then he dies. And then she realizes, once that happens, that you know the, the veil across her eyes is lifted, and now she can see all of the creepy paranormal stuff that's happening around her that most people never see. Once you kill one of them, now you have the sight. And so she could see them go, you know, what's happening, and it makes her life more complicated. <laughs> and I, I think I really, really liked it. And, and who Nettie was, she's um, a character who is half Native American and half African American. And so she's got issues in the Old West, of course, that are even more severe than being one of those, you know, being of that, those ethnicities would be today. So she's got all kinds of, of things going on with her life, and then add in the vampires and harpies. I mean, there's harpies. I love the harpies. So so check that out. That she's one of my favorite writers for sure. What's the title of the game? Wake of Vultures is the first book, and then of course I love Chuck Wendig stuff. His um, his Miriam Black, when she shakes your hand, she gets an image in her head of when and how you're gonna die, not why. But when and how, and it makes her antisocial because she keeps she doesn't want to keep seeing people dying in her head, right? Yeah. But then at the same time, she's not exactly totally honest. She knows you're gonna die. She might just show up and then take your wallet once you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> she knows where to be. She knows when to be there. So 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 yeah, she'll just eh, I'll take that, you know. So so that that kind of thing. She doesn't have to do anything but show up, right? But, but still, it, it really complicates her life as well. So um, I found that that's now in three, there's three books out for that one. The first one's called um, Blackbird, Blackbirds, I think. And then um, there's three of those out. And then the, the fourth one, Thunderbirds, is coming out. And I got to read that ahead of time. And it's set here in Arizona. And I was just like, ah, this is so cool. Oh, yeah. So yeah, Chuck's been out here a few times. And so he's gotten to know Arizona a little bit. And it's really cool what he did. So. All right. Uh, other questions, or we good? Yes, sir. I'm just from like an author's perspective. I know there's like a lot of uh, conventions where authors go, and people can go and meet like a you know a bunch of their favorite authors at once. Mm -hmm. like book con and the RT convention, and what would you say is like one of the better ones? Cause, you know, you get to fly out there and go, and yeah. is anyone that like really stood out to you that was the great? one I was just at New Orleans. It's a brand new one called StoryCon, and next year it will be held on September 15th and 16th on Canal Street. And so you're at easy walking distance to the French Quarter and all that. Okay, so this is the first time, I didn't know what it was gonna be like because it was the first one, we had no clue. Um, it was fantastic. Um, we had, it, it, there weren't so many panels, it was a lot more opportunities for, hey, let's let's have, uh, here's a dinner and here's a breakfast and here's all these things, you're just really just hanging out with the authors and, and chatting and stuff. And then there's a big, huge signing as well. So I took a lot of pictures with folks and, and you know, like, like for the banquet, you know, the authors ate ahead of time. So then we could just sort of hang out with folks while they're eating or doing whatever. So, yeah, I was just kind of hanging out by the bar. I had a beer in my hand. I'm like, I'm standing up against the wall. Come talk to me. You know, and that's what folks did. You know, it was just, it was just, it was just fun uh, to do that. So, I, and then uh, from an author perspective, it was fantastic because I, like, sold more books there than I would have at RT. Because what was happening is all the readers are talking. And they're like, hey, that, that, that dude over there with the beard in his hand, he writes pretty cool books, you should, you should try him out. So that kind of talking was happening. And so all of the authors did very well because everybody was sharing about who was there. And then all the readers were happy because they got to see all the authors they wanted to see and have time to take pictures with them and just chat with them a little bit and get all their books signed. So, and then we're in New Orleans, which was a party. So <laughs> and, and it was great. I went, I went with my mom. My mom went, she'd never been in New Orleans. So she came with me, and so we go down to Bourbon Street. <laughs> so we go into this place called Crazy Corner, and it was really crazy because they spelled it with K's. <laughs> All right, so we go in there, and um, it, there's a Zydeco band, and, and she never heard, that neither of us had heard Zydeco live before. And there's a guy who's just wearing one of those big old washboards, you know, and then you got another dude, and he had, he was basically all hair, um, and he was playing uh, the fiddle, and so on, and it was fantastic music. And uh, my mom is 70, 
And and so I get I bought her a hurricane just to see what would happen. <laughs> Such a good son. And, uh, and, and then uh, she, you know, in five minutes after drinking that thing, uh, she's out on the dance floor dancing for, with uh, random people from Texas. <laughs> My mom, come on, Kev, you know. So so yeah, I took a picture and then I went out and I danced with him. So uh, it was a, it was a great time and. Uh, I would recommend that one highly, more than RT. I don't think, I, I went to RT in New Orleans too, right? And New Orleans itself was fine, but I didn't find RT itself to be that much fun, and it's super expensive. And what if this happened, you would be in a podcast class, the Anton show, and he always talks about Gen Con, Gen Con, Gen Con. Oh, okay, I, I can't talk about Gen Con because I haven't been there. Uh, it's so it's so mostly a gaming convention, yeah, so and there's okay. not a yeah. large book component to it. Yeah, Gen Con's in Indianapolis, and I and I know that a lot of writers do like to go because they're also gamers, and so they're they're gonna go. Right. But I, that's not really my scene. Yeah, I I like the occasional game, but I have books to write. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's story con. Yeah, it's called Nola Story Con, and they are going to have it next year on September fifteenth and sixteenth. And because Plague of Giants is coming up, then I can't go. I won't be there. I'll be touring on Plague of Giants, but I'll be here. <laughs> So, <laughs> Emerald City Emerald Comic Con. City. Emerald City Comic Con is in Seattle, and I really like that. I'm going back. That one's fun. Yes, I and then I'll get you. All right. Um, it takes a lot of time to write well, but it takes a lot of time to read a good book. How do you portion your time out? I don't read as much as I used to. I, I wish I could. Yeah, um, I have. But if I find if I'm having a lot of trouble writing, it's probably because I'm not reading enough. Mm -hmm. You just kind of need a little. I don't know, a bank of new words and ideas yeah. in your head before you feel creative yourself. So, yeah, I, I have to make time, basically. And I'll try to, I have a giant stack of stuff next to my bed. <laughs> and then if, if I ever move them, though, like there's a lot of books I don't finish, not because I don't want to, but because I put them so, somewhere that my wife feels is inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and so she will clean, clean which means it just disappears, um, and I don't know what happened to it, and so out of sight, out of mind, here's another book that I can read. Yeah. And so sometimes I don't finish books, but um, uh, yeah, I, 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 one book that, it, it's rare for me now to find a book that keeps my interest so much that I just forget everything and read it until I'm done. And that was a book called uh, Gilded Cage by Vic James, and it'll be out next year. Mm, good, okay. get that. That's, that was fantastic. Because that hasn't happened to me since 2011. I keep track, because it's rare now, where, where it was, a book will grab me that much where I can't put it down. So I read it all in one sitting. And so that, that's coming out next year, Gilded Cage. Uh, you have a question. With the popularity of Thor, did you get any pushback with your Thor plot? <laughs> no, I didn't, um, except from a couple of folks who Worship Thor in Sweden. I got a couple of emails. Why do you hate Thor? <laughs> I don't hate Thor. I just, but I think that, that unlike all the other Thunder Gods, he has, um, well, no, no, all the Thunder Gods have issues, right? They're avatars for bad weather. <laughs> they're, they're unstable by definition. But the problem, the, the thing with Thor was, uh, unlike all of the other Thunder Gods, is he knew how he was going to die. Because there was a prophecy that says you're basically not going to die until you meet a really big snake. So if only your Mungadur can kill him, I figured he would eventually figure out that there are basically no consequences for my poor behavior. If I want to stop being heroic, What's going to happen to me, really? <laughs> right? So that was my rationale for him slowly turning into a sociopath over time. <laughs> not, not because I hated him or anything. I just thought that the mythology suggested a possible pathology. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's where that came from. All righty. So uh, I think we, we're good uh, with, with questions and stuff, and we can start signing things. And um, what Do you have something to say, Patrick? I was just wondering if you're ready to get signing. You're, you're looking ready. Yeah, I, I would like to be. I want to pet the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really want to take a picture of the dog and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, so in order yeah. for, for a safe signing, yeah, if we could have everybody go ahead and stand up when you're ready, and go ahead and pick up your chairs and place you to the side, that'd be great. Kevin's gonna go ahead and stand at one of the tables. Let's give him a big round of applause. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And for those of you who are interested, every third Friday here at the Poison Pen, we've got a science fiction fantasy book club called Sci Fridays. So if you're at all interested, come on out. Ladies and gentlemen, I forgot to ask for those of you who are new here, if you could get in a two order based on.